six. Um, uh, we've got a couple issues that we're going to talk about this morning. The first is the municipal borrowing, the short-term borrowing bill that we did some work on yesterday. And I'm hoping that we can um, finish our work on that. Um, the plan is if the, if the committee is in agreement with the draft that we have in front of us, the plan is to um, take a, a, a vote on that. We'll do a roll call vote on that. Um, and then we will um, send it, rather than introduce it as a committee bill, we'll send it to the appropriations committee in the form of a memo um, so that they can turn it into a committee bill. It does have an appropriation section, so it would have to go to them anyway. And by doing it this way, we can move it more quickly. Um, Kitty is aware that it's gonna come to her. So that, that's the first part of the morning. Um, and then the next piece is to um, look at the miscellaneous tax bill. Um, we've looked at it a bunch of times, um, both when we were in Montpelier and now. Um, and um, it really, the, it, in the beginning, it seemed as though we would only be able to do, you know, very few sections of it. It may be possible to do more of it than we anticipated. Um, I've asked Sam if he would sort of take the lead on it and be the reporter on the floor. So um, he's going to, um, you know, be uh, sort of actively involved in making sure that we've got the pieces that we need to have in that bill. And I don't know that we'll finish that today, but it's, um, I don't think there are a lot of outstanding issues. So that's the second piece. Um, and then tomorrow we do meet and we are gonna talk about education finance again, um, but I'm giving us a break today. So, um, so with that, I think it's uh, Becky Wasserman who's gonna present the draft to us. Sure, um, I just need Sorsha to bring up the, the draft. Thank you, Sorsha. Um, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. So um, what you have in front of you is a revised draft and I have highlighted in yellow all of the changes that were made. Um, I was able to speak uh, with the treasurer yesterday to go over um, some of the comments that were raised in committee and some other um, concerns. And so I've um, incorporated those into this new draft. Um, in section 1A, um, the first highlighted change is in the intent section. And you'll see that the word, the words statewide education have been added in front of property tax deferrals. And this is um, a change that was made throughout the document. Um, when speaking with the treasurer yesterday, um, it was raised that the, the, the draft was not clear um, as to whether this was specific to just um, short-term borrowing costs related to the statewide education property tax or whether it could also be applied to the municipal property tax. And um, she could uh, speak to this more, but the I think the cost for having both of those um, included would be much higher than um, just the statewide education property tax. And, and I believe it was the intent of the committee to just focus it on, on statewide education property tax. So I've made that change throughout the document. Um, the next change is on lines 13 to 14. Um, I believe it was uh, Karen Horn uh, raised this yesterday that um, this intent section references using CARES Act uh, funds to fund this program. However, it's possible that additional federal funds may be uh, available in the future that could be used to support this program. So I've added in language that allows for um, any other funds that may be granted to the state and used to reimburse short-term borrowing costs. Um, then moving on to uh, subsection B, um, in the previous draft, there was just uh, one definition for short-term borrowing costs. In this draft, um, I just, I highlighted uh, line 15 because I um, added in a new definition here and had to reorder it a little bit. So. If we move on to the next page, you'll see that the new definition is a definition of municipality. Um, and there are, the, the definition that was used um, in the previous draft was pretty broad and included, as we discussed, um, school districts, fire districts. Um, there are a number of other definitions of municipality throughout statute 
um, I thought it it might be most it might be simpler to just um, define it for specifically for this draft um, in the uh, mo more narrow way, which is just city, town, or incorporated village, rather than trying to um, fit it in with one of the the definitions that are already in statute. So um, so throughout the the definition of municipality use would just be city, town, or incorporated village. Um, so moving down, um, the next change on line 16 is again the reference to the statewide education property tax. Um, on the next page, um, I have uh, just highlighted where I had to cross reference um, the new terms that have been defined. Um, and then uh, Moving down in uh, subsection E, there's another uh, E3 on line 11, there's another reference to statewide education property tax. Um, the, so uh, there, so subdivision four, um, one of the eligibility requirements is that the expenses must be consistent with the use of funds authorized in the CARES Act as may be amended. So I've also added in here um, a requirement that uh, the, the expenses must meet re any requirements of any other federal funds that may be granted to the state, um, just in case there's um, another source of funding available. Um, subdivision five is not highlighted, but uh, one of the questions that was raised in committee yesterday was whether the treasurer could go, uh, go out and seek um, and negotiate interest rates with banks. After speaking with the treasurer yesterday, um, and I'll, I'll let her speak to this, uh, this uh, seemed like a very a difficult uh, task for her to do um, based on the fact that um, interest rates are changing daily and that municipalities all have different credit profiles. Um, so she felt that subdivision five was, was sort of the best uh, that could be done with respect to interest rates. Um, in the administration section, um, subdivision one, there are still blanks there about when uh, the, the treasurer would uh, re be receiving certifications to min uh, for municipalities to make and uh, receiving applications. So that would need to be, that's a decision point that needs to be made. Um, and scrolling down to section 2D at the bottom of the page. Um, the treasury guidance that I, I think you all discussed yesterday um, happened to have some uh, additional information on whether the CARES Act funding could be deposited into interest bearing accounts. Um, so since we are setting up a special fund here um, that would be re possibly receiving CARES Act funding um, it was made clear in that document that um, it, it is it is possible to put those funds in an interest bearing account, but if that happens, um, that interest has to be used in a specific way that is um, consistent with the use of CARES Act funding. So um, I added in here in subsection D that all interest earned on fund balances shall be credited back to the fund. Um, if this language is not in there, it would otherwise go to the general fund. Uh, and then uh, still highlighted in section three is the sum of the appropriation, as well as whether this is just an appropriation in FY20 um, or whether this would need to be in FY21. Um, I guess one of the points I would raise with this is that I think this is aimed at the, the June collection date for the statewide education property tax, but I there is, I think, a December date at the end of the year that would be in FY21. So I don't, I don't know if the intent is to perhaps capture that as well. Right. Uh, let me see if the committee has questions. Um, I don't see anybody. Um, so it seems to me that the outstanding issues are the dates. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Emily. Go ahead. Thanks. I was a little slow with my mouse there. Um, okay. And George. Way back at the beginning, um, around the definition of short-term borrowing costs, I just, um, including is not an, ex I wanna confirm that including is not an exclusive term 
So if there were say fees related to borrowing, um, would those be eligible? Um, that's correct. Including is, it, it's not an exclusive list. Um, I don't know if you're, I know yesterday there was a discussion of administrative costs to municipalities. Mm -hmm. So it does not explicitly state that, um, but, but this list is not an exclusive list. Thanks. George. You're muted. I know, <laughs> but the screen keeps changing was as the documents come and go. So where my unmute is moves. Um, just a little thing at near the end, I, the name of the fund, since we're, it's not for all municipal borrowing, it's really about the education property tax. Should that be reflected in the name of the fund so it's not confusing to people? I, I can certainly make that change. Um, I mean, the, the purpose of the fund is stated, so um, it could only be used for a specific purpose, but um, it, it might help with confusion. It's not unthinkable to me that we might at some point need to have another emergency borrowing fund for municipalities unrelated to the, you know, to education, uh, statewide education property tax. So I think I'd be more comfortable if we were a tad more specific with the name. That's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, see, other questions at the moment? Um, and we can make those changes, you know, since we're forwarding this as a memo, um, that they're not that not that difficult, I hope, anyway, to make uh, the dates um, that we need to need to do. George, did you want to jump back in or? Did yeah, I'm sorry, I had a, a second piece. Um, yeah. do, do I assume correctly that um, on the last page, uh, page five, that the, the dollar amount we will leave blank and leave that to the Appropriations Committee? Yeah, we'd be guessing um, and they're gonna have to make a decision about it anyway. So it's, it's not a bill, um, I think it's fine. Um, so, uh, dates, um, and I, um, I, I, I don't know, um, if the treasurer has a suggestion about the dates, I'm not, I'm happy to put in whatever somebody suggests and if it, so, um, my understanding, Beth, is that you're going to, um, uh, be in house appropriations tomorrow. And so if they're whatever issues are that we've left hanging, they can deal with at that point. Um, but do you have a recommendation about the dates in here? I think you're muted if you're trying to speak, but. Yes. There we go. Can you, you, you can go. hear me now? Okay. Yes. Uh, for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer. And uh, rather than put a specific date because we're, we're looking at, um, uh, you know, when this will actually be enacted and the sooner, obviously, the better. So one suggestion might be not later than seven days after enactment and begin accepting applications not later than 10 days after enactment so that it leaves a little flexibility. I will tell you that once we are aware uh, that uh, this is moving forward, and I think it will, uh, uh, based on uh, what I've seen with this committee, um, we would we would start working on it um, in any events, but I think that that might be a way to do it uh, so that uh, depending if it gets held up someplace, uh, we don't have to go back in and play with the dates again. Okay. Um, Becky, does that make sense to you? Okay, that sounds fine. Yeah, I can add that in. Okay. Uh, and um, the other uh, note I just made to myself is that the memo is going to go to the appropriations committee because they're the committee that's going to actually turn this into a bill or introduce it. Um, but we will also um, make sure that we copy uh, house government operations because they're going to have an interest in it. And I've been talking with Sarah occasionally about what we're doing, but I've, I've missed a step yesterday. So I'll make sure that she has. It. Um, and Senate finance, I think, has already started to do some work on this. So there is some effort going on in the Senate already. Um, to have this move fairly quickly. Uh, any other issues on the bill? Uh, George. Yeah, also on the, la on the last page, um, line three, 
the FY20, I think we need to include FY21 too, don't we? I, that's, a, that's a policy decision. I tend to agree, um, but we would only, we wouldn't appropriate for both years. And the truth is that we could appropriate money for 20 that would stay in the fund for 21. Uh, we don't need to do two separate appropriations, I think. Um, so the question is whether they can, whether the borrowing can happen in fiscal 21. And I don't know what that says in that respect. I, I can, I could make it clear that the appropriation is in FY20, but it could be for use in both 20 and 21. That, that makes sense to me because um, it's going to sit in the fund. So um, yeah, Beth, did you want to jump in on that? Uh, yes, please. So I think that uh, where this is located in the statute, the presumption is that this is a fund uh, that carries forward uh, so that uh, 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 the amounts of money that you appropriate in 20 would carry forward to the uh, into 21. Um, uh, since the application period is uh, through December 30th, um, I, uh, or excuse me, the uh, cost incurred between uh, March 1st and December 30th. I think that that's clear. That said, making it clear with more clarity would be be, be fine. And um, the interest does have to stay in the fund, as uh, as Becky pointed out. Um, so, are people comfortable with the way it's structured in terms of dates and timing? Okay. All right. Um, so the, the change that you're going to make, Becky, is on, on the, the, the dates for the start, you know, the, the applications um, and um, the, date, the name of the fund. The, are those the two things that we've got? Um, Emily. And would you like me to change in the appropriation that it can be used in both years or just leave as is since it will be, the, the balance will be carried forward in the fund? Actually, I wouldn't mind if we said both years. Okay. in the appropriation section. Um, yeah, Emily? That's um, what I wanna better understand. What are the risks to leaving it a little more open so that we could be say flexible in six months if we see another need um, that might be easier to sort of use this fund for than another one? Um, what do we gain by sort of narrowing the title of the fund and the dates associated with it? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, one thing that comes to mind, if CARES Act funding is used, then that has to be expended by the end of the year. Um, the fund is open to getting appropriate other appropriations, but if those federal funds are used, I think it, it does have to be limited to, there is a time period that limits the use of the funds. So, so to, to go back to the two dates that we were talking about, you know, five days before, five days after or 10 days after, I can't remember exactly how they were structured. Those are just when the treasurer has to have the applications available to towns. So that doesn't restrict it to one year or the next. Um, the other date, which is the appropriation language, what we're saying is that we're gonna appropriate the money now and the house appropriations may change this structure because they know more how to appropriate money than we do, but um, but that we're going to appropriate the money now and you can use it for both fiscal years. That that's going to be the way it's it's set up. But the limits on how it can be used that it's just for education property tax that's embedded in the whole bill at the moment. Um, and if we decided to make it available for municipal property tax or something, we would have to come back and create a new fund or amend it. That, that make, I mean, does that make sense at least? Yeah. Um, so um, subject to those changes, um, does somebody, would somebody like to move that we uh, endorse this? I'm not sure what the right word is, but um, yeah, Becky, did you wanna ask a question first? No. Um, yeah, uh, George. Um, yeah, I was gonna just say um, that I'll move, make that motion to 
uh, endorse this with the changes we have just discussed. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Jim, you're muted. Glad to second it, unless someone has already. No, you're all you're you're right in order there. Um, oh, good. So. Um, so it's, it's been moved and seconded that we endorse the language with the changes. Um, are people comfortable voting without actually seeing the changes at this point? Or do you wanna wait? People are good. If you have not, just raise your hand and tell me and I'll wait. Um, okay. Um, so uh, it's been moved and seconded that we endorse this. We will put it in memo. Um, your motion, I'm sure, includes the memo that we're going to send to House Appropriations with a copy to House GovOps. Um, and uh, Robin, if there's no more discussion, uh, perhaps you could call the roll. Okay. I'm just finishing writing to copy to GovOps. Okay. Uh, Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. Yes. Representative Donovan. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Masland. Yes. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Young. Yes. Representative Canfield is not here. No. Okay. Right. And Representative Ansel. Yes. 10-0-1. Great. Um, nice work. Um, so. Thank you all. Um, I think this is this will make a difference, and I I was um, it, it, I was glad to hear that the league actually felt that it, this would actually make a difference for the towns that are in a really tough spot. And you know who knows it may be a vehicle for doing more in the future um, for in some other areas. But uh, and thank you, Beth, very much for your help with this and um, your involvement has been really uh, productive and useful. So thank you. My pleasure, and thank you very much, the committee and chair, for all your good work on this and so many other issues during this uh, very unprecedented time. Uh, the number of hours that you must be putting in are extraordinary, but thank you. Well, yeah. Everybody, I think, has been doing a lot of that. Um, so um, we are going to move to miscellaneous tax, and I think it's Abby and, let's see, who do I have? I have Abby and Graham. And is that it on this? Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know which is the best place to start. I sh I'm sorry, I should have my, I should have this sitting up in front of me so that I'm not exactly what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Abby, why don't you start? Um, a lot of it we've seen, we don't need to go through every detail, but if you could tell the committee describe the two documents that we've got um, and maybe flag any part of it that we uh, need to focus on. We've been through these small sections interminably. I don't think we need to do it again. Um, also, I'll save everybody from that. Um, if anybody wants to stop on any of it, they can, and we'll have a discussion if you've forgotten about it. Um, but the question that I've got for the committee is do, are, do people, think that this is the right time to do basically the whole bill that we had in front of us? Um, or do they want to focus just on the most critical pieces? And when we met on this two or three weeks ago, we were looking just at the most critical pieces because we didn't even know if we were going to be able to vote on the floor, let alone vote on something complicated. Um, but at this stage, um, things seem to be moving um, I wouldn't say rapidly on the floor, but they're moving. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I think it's really up to us um, how much of this we want to bite off. Um, I realize I'm talking and to gets to present. But Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I, just let's. Um, we spent a lot of time with the whole thing. Let's send in the whole thing, and if the uh, if the Senate says we can't take a bigger bite, then they can pare it down. Yeah, they're, they're more agile than I am, which is not a word I've ever thought I would use for the Senate, but they are yeah, more agile you. than I am. <laughs> and <we> are. <laughs> and so I think they're fine if they get the whole thing. Um, Robin? I was going to agree with Scott. I think we, we've done all this work, and if we can get it through, unless there's something that's glaringly obvious that we shouldn't, we should go for it. 
Right. Okay. Um, the the other um, if uh, there's also a question about whether there's anything that we need to add to it based on what's been happening currently. The one piece that I would love to have included in the bill that we just did, um, but we don't have the language ready. Um, is the piece that gets us started on the state collection of the education tax. Um, and it could easily go in here um, if, we can, if we can see language that we like. Um, and so that, that would be a piece that I'd like to have us le at least look at. And there may be some others as well. Uh, George, Jim, Jim, and Emily. Well, there were like eight things on the side by side. There were about eight things listed at the end that we're gonna get put into other bills. And I would need to go through those again because I don't know what's happening with those other bills. Um, so I kind of would like to go through those and make sure we shouldn't, there aren't yeah. things that need to be included in here. Yeah. Good, good thought. Uh, Jim. Yeah, just back on uh, the Senate being more flexible or whatever it was you- <laughs> Agile. I'd say, I'd say at times like this, they're less inhibited. They just okay let's do it this way or that way or something you know which comes across as flexibility we've been voting a lot but we haven't actually introduced a bill yet or done any right. you know, voted a bill out uh emily um i appreciate what you said about the few extra pieces we might want to put in and i wonder if we want to go you know one step further on our education finance conversations to see if there's anything else that we might want to drop in here based on what resolution we might find in the next week or two. Um, I don't know so, what timelines we're at. Yeah. So my thought is that the the that this this bill, which is generally technical, um, generally non-controversial, would sort of go on at it tend, but it's long. It's got a lot of stuff in it, tends to go on its own. And that we would do an education finance bill that sets the yields and the rates separately, because that will inevitably be controversial um it's bound to be so um at the moment i was thinking of keeping those separate the state collection issue um because it's just getting a uh plan in motion um is and and the league is supporting it probably wouldn't be controversial so that's why it would go in this one it could go in either one though uh joey I always understood that the um, municipalities made some money by um, being able to collect that tax. And uh, obviously, if they're supporting this change, it's not a significant amount of money and it's easier for them to do the statewide collection. Well, that, that's the discussion that at some point we would def we would have. Um, we've had in the past, They um, some towns get make more money off it than others. Um, but I think at this stage, they're seeing all the downside of it because they, you know, they're, they're, it's sort of like a trust tax. You know, if you're, if you have a retail operation and you're collecting sales tax and you get to use that money for a month or so for cash flow, but suddenly you're at a place where you've got to hand it over and you don't have it anymore, um, then it, you'd be better off not collecting it in the first place or not, not being the middleman. Um, so what I'm hearing from them is that they're ready to step out of that role as, as middlemen because it has been hugely problematic for them. Um, but but that, would, that would be a, if we get to a point of actually making the change, that would be a discussion we'd have to have with them. Scott, Sam, and Emily. Yeah, and I would just, I would echo what you said, Janet, and just saying everybody keep in mind that not only is it a trust tax, but it's a trust tax that dwarfs their municipal budget in most cases, and it's very difficult to manage. Right. Uh, Sam. I, I was just gonna say that they didn't exactly say that they support it. They said they support exploring it. So it's not like we're doing it. We're just like, we're right. just like gonna start the process. So, you know, it's, I, I, Burlington shouldn't get too concerned just yet, Joe. <laughs> just, it's not a, it's not happening. It's just like, how would we do this logistically? It's just the exploring the question. Emily. Um, this is another way I'm just stumbling forward as a new person on the committee without context of either time or physicality. Um, but mentioning trust taxes, I've just, um, and technicalities and um, 
the other trust taxes that we have and sort of the challenges that we've experienced with them over the last month in how they're held and um, how they're delivered to the state um, has struck me as confusing just as a newbie that um, how folks seem to feel an ownership over them even though they are trust taxes and um, wondering if there's space for a step forward on that here or not. Um, what does that mean? Um, so like with the restaurants seem to like, you know, collect, I don't, you know, I know I'm stumbling into like probably a huge fire here with talking about restaurants and meals and rooms taxes, you know, all of that. Um, but that it seems like a lot of restaurants think of that as part of their income and like what they're sitting on as a bank account and, you know, what they might use for payroll right now and for the, shifting it to um, when in fact they're collecting it on behalf of the state. And that just strikes me as a confusing situation that we're really sitting with in a substantial way right now. Yeah, I, um, one of the ideas that somebody mentioned over the last couple, three weeks is that they should be required to hold them separately. Um, I don't, I'd like to know if any other state requires that before I, before I endorse it. But is that what you're talking about, that kind of thing? It is, and I know that, um, especially you know, in the very small micro business environment of Vermont, asking anyone to do any extra administration, which is what holding something separately would be, is a big lift. Um, but it is sort of what I'm moving towards or lightly suggesting. And I think Scott said something slightly to that effect yesterday or at some point in the recent past. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, what you have to get at with this whole conversation is and basically what businesses are doing with these uh, rooms and meals and sales taxes are um, they're using them as cash flow. Yeah. And as long as cash flow turns out the way you think it's going to turn out down the road, you're fine. You pay your trust taxes and you, you move on. Uh, what's not clear right now is if there's, um, I mean, businesses have lots of strategies for that. You can go get a line of credit, you can go to the bank, you can do a, you know, a variety of different things. The question is, is that does the state want to get involved in all those little individual strategies that every business has? Um, I'm not sure I know what the answer. I'd be interested to know what, what other states do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter. Um, I, I agree on having raised this issue in the past. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I would uh, think it useful uh, to uh, make a difference between those folks who file quarterly as opposed to monthly. Uh, that is to say, it usually reflects the size of the cash flow. And Emily's probably correct. Why would you want to add administrative burdens to a small operation? So if there were a way to essentially um, uh, leave the situation alone for small operators, but nevertheless make sure that the collections amongst the high cash flow uh, vendors uh, and businesses uh, came in in a timely manner, that might be a way to do it. Uh, Sam. Since we're all just weighing in on this one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just want, like, want to think about it like logistically for a second. Like, let's just say you're a restaurant and you get your credit card deposit every day from, does that mean that every day you need to go in and transfer a certain amount of money over to a separate bank account, like on a daily basis? Is that what we mean by segregating it? Maybe. Because, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. Seems like a lot of extra work. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the conundrum that Sam speaks to. I mean, there, the, if cash flow is the problem, the way you um, solve that is by um, making the submission more frequent, daily, weekly. Um, but the other side of that is, of course, is that now you're increasing the administration on the uh, the business to make that happen on a daily or weekly basis. So that's the that's the conundrum you f find yourself in. Well, so, um, so this is speaking from my old experience as a tax commissioner. Um, the, the way you get businesses to treat this money um, the way it needs to be treated, which is that it doesn't belong to the business, it belongs to the state, is that you have significant penalties if they don't do it. 
Um, and that's why the 8% is there. What happened this year, normally it works more or less. You know, there are businesses that are on the edge that um, start using it for uh, payroll typically um, and they get themselves in trouble and they can't catch up. Um, and that's, you know, but those are businesses that are struggling anyway. What happened this year is the department said, well, we're going to waive the penalties and in the interest. And so suddenly we're having a conversation about whose money it is. Um, but if that hadn't happened, I think we'd be in the world that we've always been in is that businesses are, are understandably very cautious about incurring those penalties are huge. Um, 8% was a lot of money. Um, so they, um, they tend, it's to their benefit to keep it uh, separated and be able to make that payment on the 25th of the month um, because the consequences of not doing that are pretty significant. This year, the um, department just said, well, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of those penalties for some extended period of time. We don't know exactly when that ends either. So, uh, Peter. I agree with you, uh, but then the fix to that would be to uh, enjoin in some way uh, that uh, apparent um, ability of the executive branch to simply say, don't bother. Um, and then the 8% would remain and could not be uh, removed, as you've pointed out. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this particular issue? Um, so, so um, it's a continuing problem. Um, and I don't know whether, uh, Sam, good, <laughs> save me. I don't know what I'm gonna say. So. Um, I, it, I, in terms of this bill that we're talking about that I've uh, said I would be happy to report, I would, I would not like to have this in this bill. Um, yeah. You mean a, se a separate account requ requirement? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am I, the eight percent. The eight percent does the thing. The you know people are required to keep their records. Um, mm -hmm. Not you know not to mention that you know the businesses pay all the credit card fees for the tax tax collection. Um, there's you know uh, I, just not interested in going there in this bill. That's all, Robin. Thanks. Um, I agree about not going there in this bill, but I would like to talk to some small businesses in town and just find out how that would work and what would be the problems and, you know, so something to think about for next year. I think that that's too much to be to be adding into now and may, it, maybe it'll never happen, but I guess for myself, I'm going to see if I can find out more from some local businesses. Well, and one of the things, um, if I'm back next year and if I'm chairing the committee, one of the things that I'd like to have the committee spend some time on is um, the authority of the commissioner with respect to sort of blanket waivers, because um, I, I felt that that was problematic. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I even have some questions about whether the statute really allows that, but, um, but not a fight I feel like having at the moment. Um, I think things are too up in the air and too difficult, particularly for these small businesses to engage in that discussion right now. So I'd prefer to wait till January to have it, but if people want to discuss it now, we, we can. That's a slightly different issue, Sam, than what we were talking about earlier. This is really the um, uh, question about whether you can do a blanket waiver of uh, penalties for an entire tax for a period of time. Um, so discussion that is probably worth having. Uh, anyone else on this sort of general area? Uh, so uh, Abby, I think I'm back to you <laughs> on the bill. Sure. Um, so good morning, Abby Shepard, Office of Legislative Council. Can I um, answer just from a quick um, search online one of your questions about what other states do. I see oh, that yeah. um, New York does uh, recommend that sales tax uh, vendors or sorry vendors who are collecting sales tax do uh, establish a, sec a separate bank account and they have the authority to require certain vendors to, to segregate funds um, if those vendors have failed to collect and remit sales tax or haven't filed returns. And I don't on a quick 
several minute search, I would want to do more mm -hmm. um, sort of looking through Vermont statutes. I don't think there's a similar requirement in Vermont statute, but just put it out there. There are other states that have looked at this. So I, I would want to do more research first, but just so you know, it is out there. Um, so, and then shifting gears to the question of the current um, deferral, I don't know if you want me to talk about what has been done, just to remind the committee, um, uh, and some vagueness. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. Sure, so um, the two uh, remittance deadlines that were waived by the Commissioner of Taxes were for March and April, so those are for collections in February and March, so they're always remitted a month later. So as of um, May 25th, sales and use tax and meals and rooms tax should be remitted again. And penalties would apply if they miss the May 25th deadline to remit for, certainly for April, what's not, what the um, deferral announcement is silent on is whether those vendors or operators, if they're not remitting for March and April, or sorry, for February and March, it's not clear that penalties and interest will apply if they never remit those right. two months. So that I just wanted to point that out, that it's- There was no, no end date. That was, that was part of the concern that I had. Uh, part, part of it was the authority and part of it was the fact that there was no end date. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, that was all I had on those two yeah. discussions. Um, what I think that where that idea of segregating had come from was the requirement in the miscellaneous tax bill right now to segregate funds received from the state. So I can pull the, um, in terms of property tax, I'm sorry, let me just pull. Um, it's in section three. So when the state um, is providing funds to towns to help them in meeting the cost to prepare the grand the education property tax grand list um this new language would require towns to segregate so that's i think what it sort of sparked that question about what do we do for trust taxes so that's in the current bill that's one of the um it's also one of the sections that uh shows the payments that towns receive so there is representative donovan's point about towns are receiving some funds currently for collecting and administering the education property tax. Yeah, I can't remember the amount. Is it like $5? It's quite, I think it's $1 per parcel. Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was I okay. think, well, so I also want to do some more research to get back to you is I think there are other, there's another provision where towns receive um, funds from the state for the administration, but in this particular section, it's one. Just, just um, a dollar. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, one dollar per grand list parcel in the municipality. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, sure. Abby, so I have interrupted you. You go ahead. Sorry, I'm gonna just. Can you hear me? Okay, it's very yeah. quiet today. Okay. I can. I don't know about everyone else. People good. Yeah. Um, so the the few sections that it, we the committee had discussed, I think I was last in March 31st on this bill. Um, are the first two sections in particular having to do with property tax. And the first um, extends the deadlines for towns to make corrections to the grand list. Right now it says before December 31st, it gives towns one extra day. So that could be helpful in the current environment. Mm -hmm. There's also in the second section of the bill, the recording requirements. Towns um, are currently required when they make an extension for filing the grand list with um, the Department of Taxes, PVNR, um, they have to record it in the town records. This removes that requirement, which also would make sense um, re removing one of the administrative burdens on towns. Um, and then the third, I believe Chair Ansel, you had um, pointed to the use tax um, changes that are proposed in this bill. It's a slightly different proposal than what the administration had initially proposed, but it decreases the amount that individuals have to pay. Yeah. But um, when you talk about third, you're, you're reading from a list that we created two or three weeks ago when we were yeah. thinking we needed, we needed to focus just on the most important pieces. Correct, right? and that's section seven of the bill. And that's, okay. 
I just um, wanted to highlight those. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, uh, Abby or, has given us the entire section by section. Um, and I think somebody was asking about the items at the end here. Um, do you want to touch on those briefly sure. just so that we know what we didn't do? Um, Absolutely. Or what in here? So the, the final page of the section by section lists all of the proposals that the administration had made that the committee removed either that went into another bill or that did not, were not taken um, up that anywhere. Not to do yeah. Um, and it's the last three and I've noted the bills that they were moved into. Mm -hmm. um, these three are all technical changes, mostly. Um, so the first is to is purely technical. I'm looking at 32 BSA 9271. This is the third from last change. It amends which to that it went into the technical corrections bill. Um, that I don't know if you'd want to add back in here or no. that could wait. <laughs> it's, Honestly, the uh, last thing I feel like doing is a bunch of technical corrections if we can avoid it. Yeah. Um, same with the next change under that in section 9202. It, has been in statute for a very long time. It's an incorrect reference to federal statute that can can wait. Um, however, the final change on this list that amends um, last year's uh, market-based sourcing effective date, yeah. um, it said that it was after January 1st of this year. So this might be a change that you'd want to include to add the on or after, talking about the taxable years that the change applies to. Well, that ended up in budget adjustment. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking that said budget. Um, oh, let me check that then. I can check that to see so if that's- I don't need to do it twice because that'll make no, things that's worse. Um, so let's find out if it actually is elsewhere. It is an important one to do. So if it's not okay. elsewhere, we'll put it in here. Great. Is that okay? Um, uh, I don't know if people had a chance to look at any of this, but are there questions about any of the other uh, sections here or concerns about um, anything, anything you want more information on. Um, I'm looking to see if anybody is jumping in. Um, Graham, you had, um, you were going to, you had some additional information for us, which is, I guess, related to, um, to this or to um, sort of timing questions and conformance with federal law. Do you, it, it does, do you want to talk about those now or? Um, I can. Um, it's whatever you like. It's not, it's not identically related to the miscellaneous tax bill per se. It's more, I think, just thinking about the, the link ups and I think things to put on the committee's radar for. Okay. So let's wait on that. Let's, let's finish with miscellaneous tax. And then if we have time, we'll, we'll shift to that. Um, can I just add one thing on the, yeah. Miscellaneous tax, um, just to give the community a sense, section seven of the bill, the, yep. the use tax table, um, I had that as a revenue impact of about a million dollars down. So that's the only major revenue um, piece in the bill. Yeah, well. Doesn't seem like a time to uh, reduce revenue. On the other hand, those use tax tables are too high. That they don't seem fair to me. So, oh, hi, got well time field. Um, anybody have any thoughts about the use tax table? Yes or no? That's a that's a big decision. I mean, a million dollars is a million dollars. Sam, I thought <clears throat> what we came up with, which was more than the administration proposed, was pretty fair. Um, it is a million dollars, but it's a million dollars down because we collected many, several million more because of the marketplace facilitator yeah. um, language from last year. So yeah. it makes sense to me, um, yeah. just for pure fairness sake. Yep. That tends to be where I am, but I'm interested in George and what other people are. I just want to say I agree 100%. <clears throat> It doesn't feel like a time that we should be giving up money, but it really is about fairness here. Yeah. 
Anyone else? So for the moment, unless I hear an objection, it's gonna, it'll stay in the bill. Um, it's probably the one substantive piece, the, the most substantive piece that's in the bill. Um, Sorry, Jen, I missed it. Bill? I had, to, I had a phone call, so I missed the conversation here, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know when you came in, so I'll do the best I can to catch you up. Um, the, um, so we're, we're talking about the miscellaneous tax bill, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, we had some discussion about trust taxes and various sort of related things, but nothing that's in here. Um, and then we're looking specifically at the changes in the use tax safe harbor language, which we all agreed early in the session needed to be adjusted because of all the on online uh, purchasing that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But it does result in a loss of revenue of a million dollars. So we're, I think, I think we're generally in agreement that we should um, right. keep that in the bill. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. so, anything else anybody wants to um, wants to throw out there? Um, how do people feel about including uh, language on the state collection of the education tax in here? Um, you mean from uh, Rebecca's Wasserman? Well, I don't. I don't know that she. Uh, she was working on something. I don't think it. I didn't. I haven't seen it. Um, so, um, so it would be Becky who would who would work yeah. on it. But, um, but it would. It isn't to change the way we administer it. It's just to get the thing moving. Let's see. George, Robin, Jim, and Sam. Yeah, I would. I would agree with putting it in this. I think it's better sooner than later to um, begin that discussion. So I, I would agree putting it in here. Okay, Robin. Um, I agree. I think for the same reasons we need to get started. It's going to be um, you know more than one year to take to get this done. So start now. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, um, we've gone through this many times over the years, and it's time to get it moving. Some of us have done it a bunch of times. I'm a little bloody by it occasionally. Uh, Sam. I think it's fine to include in here. It's just, you know, a little bit of th thinking about how to get the ball rolling on it and what, you know, what all the logistics would be involved. So certainly not doing it, but it, it's important to start thinking about it. And we have, we continue to bring it up. And now um, it's actually this situation that's really kind of brought it to a head. So I think, I think it's worth putting it in. And this would be a good vehicle. Okay. Um, so that means that I guess what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a straw vote on, on what we have in front of us. Uh, we'll hold off a vote on the bill until we get the language on the state administration. Um, so um, I, I, if we're ready um, to do a straw vote on this, on the, all, all of the rest of the material that we have in front of us, um, which doesn't foreclose adding anything. It just says we're done with all this. Um, I entertain a motion on that. So moved. All right, uh, seconded, look like it's seconded by Jim over there. Sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, just because of the awkwardness of the way we vote here, we're gonna call the roll, but it is a straw vote because it seems like the easiest way to do it. Um, so uh, Robin, so the motion Robin, um, is to support the uh, miscellaneous tax bill as described in the section by section summary, understanding that we may add sections to it. And one of them is gonna be the state administration section. Uh, George and Joey. So in, I went briefly through Graham's presentation last night um, and it, there were places in there, at least one place where, um, part of the, I think it was PPP um, loans could become taxable in Vermont, in, in his words, depending on how Vermont um, links up to the federal system. And I just, I, I would like to explore that before we close this bill out. I mean, I'm happy to take a straw vote now, but I wanna make sure that there aren't other pieces that have come up due to the federal 
right? But, right, and that's why it might, we might add more than just the state administration to this because there may be other pieces once we hear from Graham. The, this bill includes link up language, but it's to fiscal, uh, I'm sorry, not fiscal, calendar uh, 2019. So it doesn't include any of the CARES Act changes. So there is link up language in here, which is the way we normally do it. We look back a year. Um, so, um, but yes, that we'll, we'll, we'll close out all of this if the committee agrees. Um, and then we will continue to talk about what we might wanna add to it. Uh, Joey. I'm all set, Janet. You're all set. Um, so are people clear on the motion? Um, yeah. Who, I, I did not write down who, I don't know that it matters who made the motion and who seconded. Peter and Jim. Peter and Jim. Okay. Um, so what we're what we're um, voting on is the sections one through one through twenty four um, in this in the section by section understanding that we may add sections to the bill that we're voting to agree with those. Okay, George. As I look at the section by section, um, there's not a check mark in the boxes of 22, 23, and 24. Uh, and, and you just said we were voting on those sections too. Did they have, did they need more discussion or is it just, <laughs> Abby, you want to explain? Sure. Um, so the sections 22 and 23 were the judiciary fees. Um, and I actually hadn't gotten a solid, I think we had discussed this again uh, at the end of March. Um, and I think that there was a general consensus to move forward with these, but I haven't had a solid okay from the committee. Do you want me to briefly touch on what they are. Would that be helpful to be sure? sure. Yep. <coughs> um, so the $10 surcharge um, is for failure to pay a penalty after healing, hearing or default judgment um, at the municipal level. The judiciary currently collects this surcharge and transfers the collections to the municipality where the infraction occurred. It's a very um, small amount. We were discussing this right before the um, emergency order and it, yeah. it's a very small I think a thousand dollars a year it's something pretty limited um, and the judiciary had requested this and the other change this change is really to just do away with what's more um, more of an administrative burden than the amount that they're actually collecting that was their recommendation the second um, section is really clarifying language. My reading of the statute is that this uh, default $295 filing fee, um, it applies to all filings unless they're explicitly charged a separate amount. Um, and this is what the judiciary has been charging. They just wanted it to be clear in statute. So it's really just a clarifying change. And the so I can add a check mark on those if you yeah. like. The Judiciary Committee did look at these um, and um, I can't remember. Rec Correct, there was a third recommendation um, which was to increase um, the Department of Taxes, I'm trying to remember if it's offset or collection authority from $47 to 50 um, because there's a $47 fee that the Judiciary charges. So the tax department, I think, just offered to collect right. for 47. So it's a minute, they didn't need a statutory change. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I didn't put a check mark in the effective date section just because those are probably going to change if there are other additions to the bill. So I left it open. Yeah. Is that, is that coming back to everybody? It is to me. Um, so uh, is there more discussion on the motion? Um, and again, understanding on the effective dates that even though we're endorsing them as they apply to what's in here, but if we add things, obviously we're gonna change. We're gonna add an effective date if we need it. Um, that okay, everyone? All right, Robin, um, people understand the motion? Okay. 
You want to go ahead? Yep. Call, call. Representative Anthony? Yes. Representative Beck? Yes. Representative Brennan? Yes. Representative Donovan? Yes. Representative Kornheiser? Yes. Representative Masland? Yep. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Young? Yes. Representative Canfield? Yes. Representative Ansel? Yes. 11 zero, 0 We're back to un unanimity. Oh, wonderful. Um, so that's a straw vote. At least that's how I'm characterizing it. Um, if we decide to add sections, we're not, it's not, we're not going to be amending the bill. We're just going to put them in and ultimately we'll have a whole bill um, that the committee will vote on formally um, and hopefully sooner than later, but we'll just keep, you know, we've kept this open partly because it is a place to put uh, bits and pieces of things as we, as we come across them. So um, I don't know. Um, Maybe Sorsha does uh, whether um, where Becky is on the language on the state collection. Abby, are you working with her as well? Do you have? Yes. So I can weigh in on that. Um, we did find the last proposal was 2011 or, and, or 2012, and we're looking at some language that was brought up then. I would just actually like some clarity from the committee if you were thinking more along the lines of a study or a working group. It sounds like it's not something that would need absolutely every detail ironed out immediately, but using that language, we could set some sort of parameters of what um, and who you'd want to be doing that study committee, I guess, are my questions. Right, I, I think, um, so um, I don't know if others want to weigh in. I, I think I something that's a little, um, got a little more weight to it than a study committee but, um, but less weight than doing it. <laughs> so um, I think the idea is to say, we, we, let, we want this done, um, but we wanna know, you know what it, how it's gonna work and what it's gonna cost and how long it's gonna take and what the, you know, we have, we'll have another chance to look at it and weigh in. Uh, Sam and Peter. How about like a tax department proposal in collaboration with Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the yeah. Clerks and Treasurers Association or something like that? That's great. I, yeah. I can't think of anybody yeah. else particularly right. that needs to be involved. Peter. Uh, back to a, uh, a query of Scott's. Um, it would be good to find out whether or not uh, there will be forthcoming um, a, um, a similar or parallel uh, recommendation from the Tax Structure Commission. Uh, not that they need to be included, but it, it, it might be nice if uh, uh, Abby or whoever our staff person on this is going to be uh, contacts the staff person for the Structure Committee and say we're, we're probably going to plant the seed for this and we hope uh, you're in concurrence. Yeah, Sarsha is their staff, so she can also um, let them know. Um, it might be something they'd weigh in on. It's sort of more administration than, um, you know, the kind of policy that I think they've been looking at. But, um, but still, we, we can. Um, I, I just wouldn't want to slow it down. I mean, they they meet monthly, I think, right? Um, I wouldn't. They're I wouldn't actually on a break want, right now. They're I'm taking sorry, a break. On a break. A yes, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to have to wait for them to weigh in um, to actually get something moving. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, Mark, do you have anything you want to? You just popped up on my screen. No, no. I, well, I, this conversation caught my interest because we, we worked quite a bit on this back in 2011 and 2012. So we do have a lot of research that's been done in a draft yeah. bill. So. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think you're right, Sam. I think the idea of t asking for a proposal, I think I would include joint fiscal um, and um, legislative council staff in that discussion. So that what my recollection when we did this last time is that it takes an astonishingly long time to implement. Um, and so that's the reason for wanting to start to move on it. But it, 
it really, because of all the transition issues, maybe some of them are better now than they used to be, or maybe we have ways of working around them that we didn't used to have, but, um, but it really took a long time. So right. there, are, there are also stakeholders that we weren't necessarily um, thinking about where we did it last time. For example, local banks and things like that had, had yep. a, lot of, uh, yep. a lot to say about it. And it wasn't readily apparent. Right. It strikes me that the local delinquent tax collectors are <laughs> uh, <laughs> gonna clerks and treasurers. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. but beyond that, the delinquent tax collectors are their own little mafia in some places. And I'm not running again, so you can quote me on that. I don't think we have to. I think you're quoted. Yeah. <laughs> That is the wonders of, of live stream. I think you're already out there. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, anything else um, that's coming up, Graham? If we've got a few minutes. Um, I think we're going to quit at 10:15, so people have a break before we go on the house floor. Um, do you want to quickly tell us what, what's in your memo? We can come back to it, but maybe just give us some highlights. Yeah, sure. Um, so what I was going to talk about is somewhat related to the miscellaneous tax bill, but it's essentially looking at some of the federal um, legislation that's passed related to the coronavirus and some of the tax legislation that's in there that will affect Vermont in some way. Um, and the, I think at some point the committee um, needs to take a look at it either through the miscellaneous tax bill next year, or if you decide to you know, look at it through a piecemeal approach saying we want to attach to this, we don't want to attach to this. So um, it's essentially looking over those those pieces. Um, and the, the bigger pieces are on the first coronavirus bill, there was the, there was some, some payroll tax credits that are, um, that could be considered um, taxable income in Vermont if the, if Vermont doesn't or Vermont decides to link up to the 2020 federal language without any changes um, or doesn't take a whole, doesn't take legislative action. Um, in the CARES Act, there were a number, there was a couple big provisions and two or three smaller provisions. The bigger provisions are the payroll protection program, the, the small business loans that everyone's heard about. Um, those loans can be for, forgiven for businesses that, that maintain the criteria for receiving the loan. And that forgiven income is not considered taxable at the federal level, but could be taxable at the Vermont level um, if we decided to sort of link up to the 2020 language, the 2020 federal statute um, as it is for at, at the end of December 2020. So the, the, the legislature might decide to, to do something different there or, or take a piecemeal approach to that. The second big one is the uh, the economic stimulus checks, the, the economic impact payments. Um, the, that's the $1,200 that everyone has received, um, depending on how much money they make. Um, and that doesn't appear to be taxable in Vermont. Um, so I, I know I've received a lot of questions about that. Right now, that's not taxable. And it's my understanding that the legislature doesn't need to take any sort of action on those to make to make. Um, to leave those as not taxable in Vermont. Um, some of the smaller provisions in the CARES Act, um, the, in the CARES Act, there was a, a provision that allowed people to take up to $100,000 out of their individual, their IRAs, 401ks, deferred comp, without having to pay the federal penalty. So up till December 31st, 2020. And so um, there's no, uh, federal penalty on any of those withdrawals, um, which means that I think um, absent any sort of changes by the legislature, we would also pick that up sort of indirectly because our penalty is 24% of the federal. So 24% of zero penalty is zero penalty. So um, we would not be taxing, we would not be applying our penalty to those withdrawals. Um, however, the withdrawals themselves would be considered taxable income. Um, the, the next one I had there was in the CARES Act, there was a new $300 quote unquote above the line charitable deduction. So recall the federal level, you can, you can itemize your charitable, um, giving, um, only if you itemize and you get that deduction. 
this created a one year tax year 20 above the line charitable deduction of $300. Um, and so this would flow through to Vermont because our starting place for personal income taxes is adjusted gross income. And so when you hear the words above the line, what that means is that it happens before the calculation of adjusted gross income. You start with gross income, then you take your above the line deductions, which are things like student loan interest, um, educator expenses is another one, and this will be another $300. So what this is somewhat important, I guess, or for consideration for this committee is um, if no legislative action was taken or we linked up completely to the federal statute of 2020, you'd have people who would be essentially double dipping on their charitable deductions. Um, so they'd get $300 uh, deduction worth um, at the federal level, which would flow through to Vermont. And then they would get our 5% charitable tax credit on top. So let's say someone gave $300 to charity, they would get to deduct that from their income. Plus they would get 5% on top of that. Um, so that's another piece of action. I'm trying to think here, what are the other ones? Another one that's a little bit my, more minute, but actually was a pretty big federal um, revenue impact was the deductibility of uh, business interest. So prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, businesses, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act being the, the federal tax reform in 2017, businesses were able to deduct most of the interest expense of borrowing, and that was limited to no more than 30% of taxable income. Um, and that affects us because the starting place for Vermont corporate income tax is federal corporate taxable income. Um, and so that change would affect us um, if we, there was no legislative action. However, I don't know what the size, the magnitude of that revenue impact was, and we don't know when they changed the law back in 2017, we did not estimate what the impact was there, but that's another um, piece. And then I think the final piece is the deduction that um, individuals can take if an employer pays for their student loans. So right now, if an employer pays your student loans, that is considered taxable income for you. Um, and what this did was for up, till December 31st, 2020, an employer pays your student loan, then that is considered, you get a deduction um, from your, it's not considered taxable income. Um, and so if it's not considered taxable income, it doesn't calculate as part of gross income. So that would flow into Vermont. So I think largely those are the pieces that, um, that I guess the committee is gonna have to consider whether they wanna take all of those or whether you wanna just take some of them. Um, and then one more thing I just want to quickly add is on the Payroll Protection Act, there's some, on the Payroll Protection Program, there's still some debate over whether a business can deduct the payroll expenses related to the actual program itself. So in normal times, a business will be able to deduct the wages they paid and the rent that they paid. However, if the IRS has said, if you take the payroll protection loan and you use that money for those reasons, you are unable to deduct those expenses. And in Congress, they're sort of lobbying to get that changed. So you'll also be able to deduct those things. So it's another potential area that the state might want to consider whether they want to um, allow that sort of deductibility for payroll protection expenses. So that's sort of the, the quick overview of what I was going to talk yes, about. Yes. <laughs> a, a lot of super complicated things. Um, so um, I, I'm not going to recite it all back because I don't think I took it all in completely. Um, but the one thought I have um, is that normally we do the link up looking back a year. Um, things are changing really rapidly um, and uh, in Congress and a whole bunch of areas, including these tax code changes. And it, it, it feels to me risky to do any kind of link up for fiscal 20 now um, without knowing what we're gonna end up linking up to. Um, I realize that we can link up to a specific provision, but it sounds like even some of those are changing, you know, the underlying um, elements are changing. Um, so that, I, my own preference is to 
weight, but um, I'm open to hearing others' views, Sam and Scott. Um, I realize that uh, we just approved uh, in this in the miscellaneous t the, this bill that we were going to do the annual link up for last the, for nineteen. Because we didn't do it last year. We always do it a year late. Yeah, it's oh. it's a little bit I guess. Okay. But you you link up the miscellaneous tax bill for the tax year previous, so it's just essentially covering last year's tax year. Yeah. So if, and, in theory, let's say if you wanted to cover, right. if you wanted to loop all these changes under Vermont set code, or you wanted them to flow through, then you know next year you could pass the miscellaneous tax bill and just say as of the, the federal statute of. December 30th to the or December 31st, 2020, and you would capture them all. Uh, one of the things that we typically do in January, and it usually doesn't make any, some, some years it's, it's hugely impactful, but most times it doesn't make much difference at all, is that we go through what the changes are that we're linking up to looking back the year. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think Abby helped us with it this year and um, before it was Peter who would do that and just go through and say, these are the, this, this is what, if, when you link up, this is what you're incorporating. And this is, um, you know, the, these are where the decision points are. And once in a while, there's something we don't link up to. You know, we look at it and we say, no, we don't want to do it. Um, Scott. Yeah, I would just echo what Janet said. I think we should be very, very cautious about linking up to any of this stuff. The, the feds have a uh, printing press and the ability to borrow trillions of dollars. We don't have any of that. Um, so we're gonna adjourn because we need to go on the floor and I don't wanna, I wanna give people a momentary break. Um, but I, this, what Graham has just gone through is complicated enough that I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna listen to it again and have a chance to ask questions as we go through it a little more slowly. Um, Tomorrow we're looking at Ed Finance, I believe, um, and so uh, be prepared with uh, with your good ideas about what we can do. Understanding that it doesn't look like we can use CARES Act money, so um, just be thinking about what um, how to how to approach the problem. But I will see you all. Shortly, I think. Okay. I'm ending the live stream now. Okay.